Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. Thor's huge hammer, the wailing Valkyrie, howling wolves and fierce elemental giants give a violent impression of the Norse myths. But at the centre of their cosmos stands a gnarled and ancient ash tree from which all distances are measured and under which Valhalla lies. In the first poem of the poetic Edda, where the stories of the Norse gods are laid down in verse, the seeress describes it in her prophecy. I know that an ash tree stands called Yggdrasil, a high tree soaked with shining loam. From there come the dews which fall in the valley. Ever green, it stands over the well of fate. It's from this tree that the father of the gods, Odin, will ultimately hang himself, an image of divine sacrifice so problematic for 13th century Christians that they left it out when they wrote the myths down. Who were the gods that inspired the Vikings, and what role did their myths and religion play in their daily lives? With me to discuss the Norse gods are Caroline Larrington, tutor in medieval English at St John's College, Oxford, John Hines, Professor of Archaeology at Cardiff University, and Heather O'Donoghue, Reader in Ancient Icelandic Literature in the Department of English at Oxford University. Caroline Larrington, you've just translated the Poetic Edda, and it starts with the Seeress's prophecy, and she foresees the end of the gods at the Battle of Ragnarok, but also the beginning of the world of humans. Can you outline their creation myth for us, please? Well, there are... Multiple versions of the creation myth, but probably the simplest one to uncover is the one which you find in the poem, The Cirrus's Prophecy, where the earth simply rises up out of the sea and the giants appear and the gods who are descended from the giants eventually kill the primordial giant and form the earth as we know it out of his body. So his blood becomes the sea, his bones become the rocks... And rather interestingly, his eyelashes become the central fence that surrounds the world of the gods. And that suggests an idea of creation coming out of destruction and perhaps a central image of violence at the heart of the Old Norse cosmos, which motivates the feud between the gods and the giants, which persists all the way through to the the final days of Ragnarok. We know that creation myths and looking for the origin of things is one of the persisting factors, in fact, the most persisting factor in civilizations. Is this the body disintegrating into the world? Is this matched anywhere else? We find it in Sumerian myth where the gods destroy the body of the mother goddess who is a large, monstrous fish-like creature. She's been complaining about the noise that they've been making because they live inside her and they're a sort of unruly bunch of adolescents and she complains once too often and they tear her apart. So in Sumerian, it's killing the mother, which is the, the kind of basis of the creation, whereas here, the gods kill the giant, who is certainly an other and, and regarded as an enemy. Is there any... Well, reasons may be the wrong word to bring the bat here, but why do the giants come before the gods? This is something I think the gods would very much like to know. The, um, I don't think we can really account for it, but we certainly find the gods going to the giants to ask them questions because the giants have more knowledge they can remember before the world existed. And the giants husband that knowledge and eke it out quite carefully and see themselves as being, in some senses, superior to the gods because they are, they are later, or they are earlier rather, than the, the gods come later. Do you know later. much more about the giants? Not very much more. I suppose um, we think of the giants as well, we think of giants as enormous creatures of stomping across the the landscape. And although the some of the giants are huge, some of the female giants are, I think, probably the same size as the gods. I'm not sure how tall that is exactly, but they're how certainly how tall is a god? We can send that well, out on the website. Yeah, six foot four, probably. <laughs> I would expect um, certainly um, reasonable size. And the giantesses, some of the giantesses are extremely attractive, and the, the goddesses, uh, the gods are, are keen to uh, perhaps marry them in some cases, or at least have sexual relationships with them. But some giantesses are extremely ugly and ride around on wolves, which is an unattractive feature. Why do the gods want to attack the giants? Quite often because the giants have something, some precious cultural item which the gods would like to have usually it's not so much hands-on attacking except in the case of Thor 
as sneakily stealing from the giants. And the giants themselves are also interested in stealing things back from the gods. But Thor is the, the son of Odin who carries a mighty hammer. He seems to be charged with a kind of population control mission. He has to patrol the lands of the east and keep the giants in check. And when his hammer is stolen on one occasion, he says, well, if I don't get it back, the giants will be moving into the homes of the gods and settling down, so I need to get it back urgently. It's the only thing that keeps them under control. Heather O'Donoghue, can you tell us what the main literary sources are for the Norse mythology which Caroline has been giving us? It's such a succinct overview way from steeped in the Edda poem which she has translated. Yes. Well, I think that the, the, the main source of the myths is the work of a 13th century Icelandic mythographer and historian, a great literary figure called Snorri, Snorri Sturluson, and he produced a kind of treatise about um, the poetry and the mythology um, of, his own, of his own traditions. And it's to him that, that we now, as, as, as later readers, know most about Old Norse mythology. What he does is he tells the stories of the Norse mythology and he quotes great chunks of the Edda poems that Caroline's translated and the other kind of verse which em- embodies mythological reference, skaldic verse. And he also tells a lot of stories that we don't know the source, what source he had for. So what so he's writing in the 13th century. Mm-hmm. What sources did, do we know that he draw on which we can call authentic? How far back does it go, in fact, well, that we can track <clears throat> properly? That's very difficult. It, it, skaldic verse, which was extremely cryptic and had um, a, a, a very, very difficult metre, um, certainly was, was being composed in the pre-Christian period. So if we Pre, can, Sorry, pre-Christian for yeah. Northern Europe or pre-Christian, pre-Christian? Uh, Pre-Christian for Northern Europe. Iceland so we're talking about the 6th, 7th, 8th century? 9th yeah. century, yes. So Iceland was, was, had a kind of official and legislative conversion in the year 1000 AD. To Christianity. To Christianity, yeah. So we better stick to centuries, because pre-Christian yeah. means a very specific thing for yes. most people, doesn't it? Mm. It means before Christ. Yes, yes. So, sorry, right. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about 8th and 9th centuries mm-hmm. getting it from. Mm-hmm. Yes. There's no, no, so where does it come from to get there? I mean, are they in the air? Are they? Uh, are they? Do we have any idea of an oral tradition? Well, before Christian, before the the Scandinavian countries were Christianized, um, literature was simply transmitted orally. So event- it, it, it all goes back to an oral tradition eventually. Um, but because of the, the meter of skaldic verse that I was talking about, it seems quite likely that verses that were composed before the conversion. Um, would have survived in oral transmission without much change. So you might talk about those as being authentic sources, but they only talk about mythology elusively, by and large. So there are rather difficult cryptic allusions to mythology, which Snorri and we as kind of later interpreters have tried to put together. We're still talking about Snorri in the Poetic Edda and the Prose Edda, his yes, Poetic Edda. Edda and the Prose Edda in the 13th century. Now, he was a Christian. Yes, that's right. Uh, and therefore he was writing as a Christian. Yes. How far did he Christianise it? And how far can we just get it? I mean, let's base it. How far can we trust him to have got it, in, in, if this word has any meaning in yes. this sort of culture, had to got it right? Yes, different people have different views about that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've just been working myself on... You, 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 you mentioned that, that some of the mythological images were so disturbing that, 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 they, weren't, that they weren't included in, a, in, in accounts by Christians. And I've just been looking at how some elements which would take the place of the, of the nasty bits that were missed out yeah. might have been brought in by Snorri from actually Christian Latin sources and not from native Well, this is an interesting type. example. It was in the introduction where Odin or Odin, uh, yes. hangs himself from a tree. Yeah. There's a spear in his side. Uh-huh. Uh, now, the connection with the tree, Judas hang from a tree, yes. the spear in the yes. side, Christ. the Christ. Now, is that Snorri Christianizing what he, he receives or is he receiving something which is like, which would be far more interesting in a way, mm. Like various aspects of the origins, as we see it, of, Christi- of Christianity. I think that perhaps what's happened there is that the poem on which Snorri is drawing for his account um, of, of of what happens to Odin is itself a late pagan production, which was perhaps its author was a poet was perhaps responding to Christianity and perhaps integrating elements from, from, from Christianity into his, his pagan response. Um, what, how, how does a god die? He's, he's bringing in elements from, 
from from the from from Christianity. So as far as we know, it started. They started Britain down about the ninth century, gathered together in the thirteenth century, oral tradition before the ninth century, up in northern Europe, uh, John Hines, where we are uh, north of Europe, which was largely unromanized or maybe entirely un-Romanized, and un-Christianized. Uh, and there has been a thought, or it has been proposed, that uh, was proposed much later, that the Greeks, as it were, or Greek ideas of God leapt over that uh, central European Christianized, Romanized block and did a great vault over to the north and sort of fertilized the Norse gods. Yes, these suggestions have been made. Um, rather than it being... Uh, a late piece of a late event in a form of influence um, in the, at the period when the, 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 the Greeks were dominant in southern Europe and uh, into the, the, the closer parts of, of Asia. Um, the most common theory has been that just as the languages of the Germanic peoples in northern Europe and indeed most of the peoples of Europe are related as part of an Indo-European family of languages, that there were also aspects of culture that went along with those languages um, and that uh, a mythology, a pantheon of different gods. It's certainly true that we can identify certain of the, of the Norse and Germanic gods with gods in the, in the Roman and Greek um, pantheons, um, that, that those were all inherited from a very distant period of um, what would have to be prehistory um, indeed, and that this really explains the um, parallels that we do get between the traditions of the two areas. Do you go along with it? I go along with it to a certain degree. There are, there are certain connections which are absolutely undeniable. For instance, the relationship in the names of, of the, the, the Greek Zeus and the Norse god Tyr, um, Tew in Old English, which gives us the name of Tuesday. Um, there, are, there, are, there are certain facts of that kind that are undeniable. My own view is that the idea that at one time there was some unified, uniform group who were the Indo-Europeans with an Indo-European language, an Indo-European culture and, and an Indo-European religion that has simply split and degenerated in some ways or, or, or diverged as the centuries have, have rolled on is, is probably a little bit too uh, simplistic and we have to allow for more influence and um, I interaction um, between tra traditions. Yeah, um, but they've got to come from somewhere, and what we've got so far is that they appeared, we know they appeared in, in printish or print in about the ninth century, and they seem to have arrived fully formed and quite complicated when you read, when you read the Edda poem. I mean, I've read a lot of it in, in Caroline's new translation and so on and so forth. There's lots of them, and they have conversations and they do all sorts of things. So... Where did they come from before that? I mean, I, I'm not trying to sort of pin you to the wall. I just like a sort of rough and ready idea. You can say it and disclaim it and well, so on and so forth, but just fill it in a bit. What happened till the ninth century? I mean, there were people up there. Yes. Uh, so where, where did they get their gods from? Well, the, the, in the ninth century, they, they, they got them from the past. They had undoubtedly been there for a long time um, before then. Um, we have various pieces of evidence for this both historical, that is in the form of textual evidence um, and archaeological too, um, which show that there are traditions that are emerging in skaldic poetry, as Heather has said, of the 9th and 10th centuries and subsequently in the prose, the Christian transmitted prose of the 13th century, where there are specific motifs, specific images of the gods that we can trace back um, archaeologically to the 5th and the 6th century in some cases perhaps several centuries before them. Uh, one of the interesting problems that we have to deal with that is that because we have um, common elements over a period of maybe a thousand years in this way, we can't, of course, assume that they meant the same um, all the way through. An area of great controversy at the moment is, for instance, the degree to which this 
principal one of the gods. You could almost call him the king of the gods or the chief god, Odin, as he appears in the Viking period, whether he was or was not already the principal deity um, of the Germanic peoples as early as the 5th and 6th centuries, which is when um, the Anglo-Saxons were first coming into Britain and establishing um, English culture there. It's a, it's a, it's a very Im- important question. Because there is a sense, I've always had the impression that in the 5th and 6th century the Anglo-Saxons who came in did bring their own gods with them and Bede tells us about that and those Mm -hmm. gods were very like the little bits and bobs I know, the Mm -hmm. gods that have been written about with such amplitude Mm -hmm. by usury and uh, talked about so so we've got them back to there but it's absolutely fascinating, if they really weren't properly touched by Christianity if Mm -hmm. the Greeks didn't hop over I'm still quite puzzled as to how they got even to the 5th century I think the answer. I'm hammering away too much. We better move on. Unless, unless it's like, sorry, yes. Well, I think one of the key answers one would see the Gosforth Cross. You see, you've got the Gosforth Cross. Well, they're on the Gosforth Cross. They are indeed. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, just to go to you, where did they come from? You're asking a question of what was the function of this mythology? What was the function of their religious beliefs? And particularly when we look at the mythology, we can see very clearly that it served to explain the world, and not just the world, the universe, the cosmos to them. There were a series of characters here that represented forces that were very important in their lives. Uh, one way of explaining perhaps the giants is that they, and the, these, the, the, the violence of creation is that these are elemental forces. This is fire, this is water, this is air coming together and mixing together and to represent it as, a, as an anthropomorphic battle. Um, is a way of explaining that these elements come together and from that and from the violence of their interaction, creation um, takes place. So I would look into that sort of psychology to say where did they come from. They came from inside people's minds in that way and of course you will then borrow names and you will borrow stories from around the place but that doesn't mean that the entire religion and the entire religious impulse as a package has got to be imported in that I, I agree with that absolutely just what you said but um, it's interesting that, that the myths don't exactly explain what, they, what, what you really do is, is you use the myths to air the problems that you can't explain exactly. so where you have the absence of a scientific explanation well a supposed explanation mm. s- things like creation which we appropriately mm. began with it's not that, that, that the, the creation myths explain in creation, but they they give you ways of of, of exactly. looking at creation, of 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 mm. of, of, yes. um, of approaching it. Really, they they, they, they they stimulate thought and they stimulate an active readership by being mystifying. Yes, you know yes. there are certain yes. things. So there's there's one bit where the um, the giant is created by being licked out of a block of ice by a <laughs> cow. Uh, where does the cow come <laughs> from? It's just yes. left as a yes. mystery. It is there to, to to puzzle you, to force you to think. Let's get let's get to grips with these gods, then, Caroline. Uh, Thor uh, figures mightily. Thor with his hammer. Sometimes it's presented in quite a humorous way. Uh, can you tell us why he, he think he's so central and significant? He's. I think his importance is. Um, within the framework of the myths themselves, as opposed to making an argument for um, how many people worshipped him in particular as against worshipping the other gods. His importance is really, I think, as the guarantor of the god's security. He's the one who stands between the gods and the giants. And at the end of the world, he'll fall fighting the mighty Midgard serpent who lives in the external ocean. He's also um, a a powerful signifier of masculinity. He has a, a beautiful wife with long golden hair. He has a couple of children who have names like um, Force and Power. He has a daughter whom he protects and is very alarmed when he discovers she's been betrothed to a dwarf while he was away. And I think in some ways he has a fertility function as well, uh, human fertility. The One of the most interesting stories involving Thor is when he discovers that his hammer has been stolen by the giants and he has to dress up as a woman to go to recover the hammer because the giants have demanded the goddess Freya in exchange for the hammer. Freya is unwilling to go for obvious reasons. Nobody wants to be made to marry a frost giant. And so Thor um, gets dressed up and goes off to giant land with um, his friend Loki, he must do the a, a much form. diminished in size, Thor, because he's lost his hammer there for his masculinity. It's a sort of Samson thing as well. The hammer is his hair. It's a very worrying situation. Yes, he doesn't. He's lost his phallus, essentially. 
Well, and that's even so, more worrying than losing your hair. Mm, possibly, yes. And so he has to go to recover it. And the, he's wearing a veil and he's um, dressed up in a female accoutrement. So the giants are still slightly suspicious because he eats an enormous amount of food at the bridal feast. And when asked why this is the case, he says, um, Loki says he couldn't eat for days before... Oh, she, of course, couldn't eat for days before coming. She was so excited about getting married. Why... Do the bride's eyes roll so fiercely? She couldn't sleep for days. She was so excited about getting married. And then Thor's hammer is brought back in to sanctify the wedding and placed on his lap. So he gets his phallus back in a sense. And that's the moment at which he picks it up, strikes all the giants dead, and everybody goes home again. So there's something fundamental about masculinity, I think, which Thor embodies and which seems to have been important to people who carried images of Thor. Thor is, there anything, is there anything got as fundamental about femininity, Heather? I think Caroline should answer that. <laughs> I think mm-hmm. Caroline's mm-hmm. really the expert on... on, on is, Freya, is, is Freya fundamental? Is, is that the notion of femininity, a fertility goddess who sleeps with everybody because that's her job as a fertility goddess? I think that's something which, possibly before the conversion of Norway, um, Freya's behaviour as a, a promiscuous goddess, apparently, who's accused of sleeping with every god in, in the room where the accusation is made, including her own brother and with the elves as well. I think perhaps there's an understanding that divine women can behave in ways which are forbidden to mortal women, and that in some senses to be um, continually in the state of, sort of sexual arousal is important as if you're going to be a signifier of fertility. But I think probably many of the myths which must have existed about goddesses have been lost, and perhaps the most important role that we see, at least told by, talked about by Snorri, is the role that Frigg, the wife of Odin and the mother of um, many of the gods, plays when her son is in danger of being killed. And she certainly um, shows herself to be a devoted mother, rushing around to try and find ways of circumventing his fate, getting everything in the universe to swear not to harm him, except for the mistletoe, which is a a fatal omission. And I think probably people would have responded to her more positively than they did to Freya. Uh, Heather, um, Caroline's straying into the society as it was, as well as the society of the gods. Are we talking about the gods as have been talked about uh, by Caroline and and by uh, John and yourself, representing, or do you think of them as representing, to a great extent, the, the mores of the society at the time, the pre-10th century societies in Northern Europe? Well, th- again, we come back to the problem of the literary representation of the myths after the time, whenever that was, however far back in town we go, after the time that, that the myths w- were originally developing. Um, and so it's quite hard to talk about which time we're, we're, we're relating well, to... Well, let's just That's take a, a leap at it. Let's yeah. call it what we know as the Dark Ages. In the Dark Ages, did you, did you have that sort of masculinity, that sort of... Uh, 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 rather ambiguous, ambivalent to sense of femininity, that sort of warrior warfare, is, is the, are they reflecting that fairly accurately or is this a, well, a sublimation? Yeah, the trouble is that it, it, it's really from the evidence of the myths that we infer things about the society, so you're ending up with, with kind of circular arguments. Right. Certainly in the Icelandic sagas, which were um, probably 13th century recreations like historical novels by 13th century Icelanders about the period before Christianity in Iceland, about the period before the era 1000 and just after the era 1000, it seems that issues of masculinity and femininity were extremely important in society. Um, and the worst, the worst insult you could offer to a, a man was to, was to um, impugn his, his masculinity. Um, and there are there are various examples of that lasted a long time in it, Northern Europe. Well, yes, I'm it is lasting a long time, possibly. Know, yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Can I ask you, John Hines, in what way were these gods, as far as we know, and 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 Heather's quite right to keep stressing the narrowness of the evidence space, mm. uh, and I'm rushing ahead, some uh, rushing outside that too often, as I, I realise, but never. Uh, in what way were these gods regarded? Were they worshipped as, as the Christian god and the Christian saints were worshipped? You devote your life. Uh, were they, um, did they interfere with humans? Were they mischievous interfere with humans like the Greek gods did? If you were a, if you were a common or garden uh, um, uh, northern European person uh, who was prepared, because as I understand it from what I read, um, some of them didn't want much to do with the gods. They believed in their own resources rather than that. But how would you regard the gods? What, would, what could you do for them and what did they do for you? 
Well, I think this is something that we, we can, in fact, answer, and this is where archaeology becomes particularly useful, because um, perhaps just turning back one, just one, one step before this, we've been talking a great deal about mythology, and we've used the term religion as well. Of course, mythology and religion are not quite the same thing. Mm-hmm. Mythology mm-hmm. is a series of stories, it is a body of literature, it's a body of art. Religion is what practically you do in your day-to-day life to conduct your relationships with a spirit world, a world of powers that you perceive as existing um, around you. And it is from precisely from the, the practical day-to-day life that, the, of the, 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 that people had that we can see them um, uh, uh, showing that they did indeed believe in these gods and that they did um, have uh, conduct special relationships with them um, in certain ways. Um, Perhaps the strongest evidence that we've got from this, and certainly the most widespread evidence we've got, comes in the form of little pendants, symbolic pendants, that people wore on their their, their dress, and from what we can tell, is the dress that they would be wearing very, very regularly, by no means just a Sunday best or anything like that, or whatever the particular feast days best, yeah. uh, would, would have been, yes, yes, or which, whichever god it was you, 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 you were following. Um, we learn about these principally because in the Viking Age, many people were buried fully clothed, and, fully clothed, and so we see them in their clothing um, lying in the grave. Um, there are quite a large number of small model Thor's hammers that were worn um, around the neck. Um, there are also small female figures. It's much disputed as to whether these represent the Valkyries, who are sort of semi-divine, um, certainly supernatural, but not actually goddesses, but female figures, um, or perhaps the goddess Freya herself. Um, on the gender issue, what is particularly interesting is that the fact that although we have a, a majority of these pendants are coming up in women's graves, they're by no means restricted to women's graves. We have them both in, in men's graves um, and in women's graves. Um, and so with the the gender divide that there unquestionably was within this society, extremely important issues, your, your, your identity as a man and woman was something really quite um, different from uh, one another. Despite that, we don't see a separate women's religion from men's religion. The, the two sexes are, from what we can see, brought together in this. They are both pursuing and, and, and culting um, the same gods in that way. Would you like to follow that up? The interaction between uh, the myths and the religion? Caroline? Well, one thing which I, I think perhaps is striking from what we see in the sagas, in these later um, prose and possibly somewhat fictionalised accounts of the way that religion was imagined to have been practised in pre-Christian Iceland, is the ways in which particular saga characters latch on, as it were, to woman god. And he is the god for them. And I think we can contrast it perhaps with um, Hinduism, where there are different gods with different functions, and you visit a particular god's temple for a particular purpose. But what we find in the sagas seems to be um, a sort of default position, if you like, for most Icelanders of generally worshipping Thor. And the people who decide to differentiate themselves are perhaps chieftains who may have an ancestral allegiance from home from Norway to Freyr or may have a particular interest in fertility perhaps and having a very successful farm by worshipping Freyr or characters who are accomplished and practised poets ascribe that to their worship of Odin and they're very conscious of Odin giving but also Odin taking away. He gives them the gift of poetry but he may ask them to pay other prices for it and one of the the greatest poems, probably, of the pre-Christian period is a poem called Sonatorek, The Loss of so- Sons, in which the poet Eyat laments the fact that two of his children have been taken from him by the gods in death, and he blames Odin to some extent for not having protected them, though this is not entirely Odin's job. But he also says, Odin has given me compensation for this. He's given me the gift of poetry that I can make an elegy for my sons. And so there we see, I think, quite a complex understanding of the ways in which the gods give and the gods take away. John? One, you, you asked about the, 
matter of was there worship in this period in the same way as we're familiar with from Christian and, in, of course, other um, contemporary religions. And I think it's very useful to get the idea that the relationship between human society and the gods, so far as we can tell, was very closely modelled on hierarchical relationships within mm. human society so that your tutelary god the, or, or goddess, the one that you chose as being your lucky deity, the one who would look after you, um, was something perhaps rather more like a patron. You expected, as, you, mm. as Caroline said there, you expected protection and gifts um, from this figure in the same time as you expected to have to provide things in the form of respect, of loyalty, of worship, and most importantly in, of all in, in, in physical form, in the form of sacrifice to that particularly particular deity sacrifice in order to maintain. Um, we sacrifice of, of all sorts of, of different things. We know from the Viking period, in fact, we know most of all of sacrificial feasts so that when animals were slaughtered, for instance, at the um, end, sometime in November, the onset of winter, you, you cut your stock down to the smallest practical um, level simply because it's very expensive to try and feed them over the winter. You would have this, um, sa the, 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 this slaughtering period, but you would then associate with that a great feast, a, a meat-eating feast, and this would be dedicated to a particular god, as 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 as, as, uh, as as a mark of respect to them. Heather and Anjou, the end of the gods is foreseen in the same verse that lays down the creation myth, yes. and it ends at a great battle of Ragnarok. Ragnarok. Can you tell yes. us about Ragnarok? Yes, um, its it, its original meaning is the sort of final end or fate, or often translated as doom of the gods. The notion of the twilight of the gods is a sort of separate issue, to, uh, a, a different version of the word, which then got into the into the later traditions. Um, so it's 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 envisaged as a kind of phantasmagoric battle between the gods and the giants, and the giants are not only in kind of standard giant form, whatever that was, but also figured as as wolves and the forces of chaos and huge extraordinary things happen. Heaven splits open and and, and wolf swallows the sun the and wolf another wolf swallows, swallows the, the moon. And, and Odin fights a wolf and Thor fights the mighty world serpent who might have been envisaged as the kind of belt or horizon that holds the whole world together. So these great sort of cosmic forces come together um, in this in, in, in a battle in which basically both sides um, are, are, are killed. Is this, is this a battle between good and evil? It's, no, it's not exactly, no, because it seems that, that well, this may be a part of the Christianization that we've been talking about, but it may be that the gods were regarded as having deserved this final mm. conflagration, that it was a, 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 a sort of, a, that it was a sort of moral end. Mm. To, to, to their I, I affairs, would, I would interpret it as, and so as, a, you know. um, as a battle between order and chaos. Yes, Again, yes, I, I think exactly. this, this yeah. moral scale of good at one end and bad at the other is not appropriate. Who's order? Right. From what we've been talking about, there seem to be a fairly turbulent lot on both sides, the gods and the giants. Yes. Who, who's on the order side in this? Well, the gods are on the, the order gods side, yes. To, they try to build things. They, they mm. tried to... When, when the wall of, of, their, of, their, mm. of Ausgard, their, mm. their home, was destroyed, they tried to get it rebuilt, but unfortunately yeah. they, they fell out with the builders, i.e. the giants. That's right. mm. but, but there's an attempt in, 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 in Verlisbau in, in this poem about creation and Ragnarok to, 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 to figure the gods as creators of things, of cre yeah. as, as creating wealth and, and order. In, and but not very well. They just weren't very good at it, really. too, yes. which is important. Yeah. The, yeah. the gods make the cultural objects they steal from the giants, they make them available to humans. Yes. And um, so, sorry, yeah, so I, was, yeah. I was going to say one of the, the particularly dignified images that you do get of the gods in the in the, the Sibyl's prophecy, this poem that you mentioned, the, the one that does give us our most detailed account of Ragnarok, which is as the gods face a crisis, um, they they have a, a meeting, they go into parliament, yes. they mm. go into council, yes. and this you get the same phrases used of this every time, mm -hmm. and and it does have a, a great dignity. Yes. Uh, about it, so you can see them. Yes, the, you know, the, 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 you you see the gods as as weak, as not being transcendental, fallible, yeah, all yeah, powerful. Yeah. They are mm. they are they are fallible um, mm. figures, but they are trying. They are doing their best. Mm. How did this 
mythology, uh, how long did it last play in Europe uh, after Iceland officially Christianized itself at, in 999 or 1000 and, and Christianity spread further north and so on? Uh, how did the Norse, myth, Norse mythology and the things it stood for... Play? Well, let's not talk about the 19th century and Wagner and all that stuff yet. If we've got time, we'll see if we can. But how did it just play through? Do we, does it keep reappearing? Is it in people's lives? It's in people's minds, I think. And firstly, when uh, Iceland converts all on one day, of course, we have to ask ourselves how, how seriously that was <laughs> yes. taken. And it's enacted in the law that you can carry on sacrificing as long as you do it in secret. But this was it, it is rescinded fairly quickly. And although there seems to be a period after the conversion where it was difficult to compose overtly pagan poetry, by the time uh, Snorri is writing in the early 13th century... I think the myths have become sort of harmless and decontaminated. I don't think he would be retelling them if he thought there's any danger mm -hmm. of people rushing off to worship Odin to see if it worked better than worshipping the Christian god. And, of course, you have to remember that it's really only after the conversion that this stuff gets written down. Because there is so, a resurrection after it, Ragnarok, isn't there? Baldr is, is, re is reborn, having yes. been killed by a shot of mistletoe. And by, uh, he's reborn yes. and, and there's a sort of Christ-like feeling about resurrection there, isn't there? Yes, there is a Christ-like feeling about that, and I think, I think Snorri in the 13th century recognised that. Mm. Um, mm. But, I, I mean, it's very hard to imagine how medieval Icelanders felt about the temporal status of Ragnarok, whether it had happened or was about to happen or would would or, or was always sort of happening in, in a mythic mm. eternity. It, it's very but hard to place it. Not to go any further than our own history in this country, and, 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 and they brought the, the gods in, we think, 5th or 6th century, they brought it as well. You're looking after the conquest, right up to the 15th century, the sort of the way that the warrior force in this country behaved, acted, acted out their lives and their costs. It seems to be very like that which was represented uh, in Norse, much more like that which was represented in Christianity, for instance, much more like that, much more like it than was represented in the Greek gods and so on. Would you say that? Well, that's a sort of warrior society. Um, <clears throat> there were uh, warrior society universals, I think, yeah. where um, what, is, what is the chief um, practice of the elite members of society, the aristocracy, is fighting either against external enemies or from fighting amongst themselves if there isn't anybody else to fight. And so ideas of glory, of personal reputation are valorised. Do you just think this is warrior society too core right around the world? I think more or less, the yes. Chinese and the warlords, the Mughals, whoever we talk about, yes. They, you may want to put a different sort of explanatory um, emphasis on what happens when you're killed in battle so that... Um, although we have no idea what Anglo-Saxons thought happened to, to their dead under the, the pagan system, if we can call it a system, um, we have at least what may be quite a late idea that in Old Norse the heroic dead on human battlefields all went off to live in Valhalla with Odin to help out the gods in the final battle. And so some warrior societies seem to be interested in the question of whether they're their warrior activities will be recognised after death and some perhaps not so interested. Well, that wasn't a very fruitful path they introduced. So, back into... It, when, you, when the Norse gods uh, uh, re-emerge in, in literature, become literature, re-emerge in literature uh, in the 19th century, there's a, there's a great revival of interest in them. What are people looking for then? And what are they finding? Yeah, I think the 19th yet? century is even a bit late. I think we yeah. might be talking about the 18th century because yeah. I've, I've been doing some work recently on, on Blake, uh, William Blake, whose great prophetic books draw to a, a surprisingly large extent on Norse mythology. And, of course, the, the Romantic poets were very keen on this thing, that the Romantic sublime, and, and they, they liked awe-inspiring incidents and strange supernatural things happening. So um, Norse myths in poetic form w w were becoming available actually through Latin translations, and they were they, th that was just what they wanted. Into the 19th century, it's slightly different because then you're looking at a kind of a myth of that, that stresses heroism and, and the triumph of the will and all that slightly dodgy but stuff. But we're also looking at, at, at myths that, that, that are brought in to define and fortify uh, a particular state and a particular state of mind of that state, aren't we? We're talking about the German becoming state yes. thing. Ab John. Abs absolutely, and we're, we're specifically talking about um, Scandinavia here and um, a variety of 
political problems that Scandinavia ran through in the 19th century, the, the, the wave of nationalism that affected the whole of Europe in this period, affected Scandinavia um, as much as everywhere else, um, and in particular Norway, which did not achieve um, complete independence, complete statehood until the beginning of the 20th century, that made great use of its, its Viking past, both, both mythological and historical. But where and why was it pulled into Germany so um, um, effecti effectively? I think because um, German scholars had really pioneered um, scholarly and um, scientific translation of Old Norse and had made it available in um, reasonably accessible editions what to people. What did they say like that was peculiarly suitable as they thought for them? Well, because it was part of their own Germanic past. If they... Um, saw themselves as the heirs of a, a pan-Germanic um, tribal system from a millennium before. And so although there wasn't um, preserved in specifically German traditions, the whole story of the creation and the gods and so on, yet they could find it in Old Norse and say, well, those are our ancestors too. And that was what attracted Wagner to this particular story. He bolted on to the traditions that he knew in German of um, the dragon-killing hero Siegfried and make an enormous um, creation to Ragnarok's story out of it and still be able to claim that as the Germanic heritage. Yes, it was a grand claim because it was anti-Christian, so it was a grand claim, uh, again, all the sort of turning the other cheek Christianity, and it seemed to be link up with the Greeks, so they were the northern Greeks. Yes. Is that too simple? They were the northern Greeks, but they were our people and not a bunch of southern yes. people who weren't feeding into Germanic heritage in, in the same way. They weren't the, the Greeks aren't the ancestors. This is a better set of gods who are the ancestors. Right. We so certainly shouldn't underestimate the strength of the individualist ethos that there is within mm. um, heroism and the heroism that is so closely um, connected to these personal relations with the gods and the choice that you have yes. um, in the relationships with the gods. If there was one distinction I would draw between the, 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 the military ethics that you get um, before the conversion and those that you get represented in the, the romance poetry which reflects the ideals of the knights in armour of the Christian period, um, it is the fact that in the end a hero in the early heroic poetry will be, sub will be saved by his own cunning, his own skill, yes. whereas the knights in armour, in the end, what will decide their survival is their Christian virtue. Thank you all very much indeed. Um, we haven't got a programme next Thursday morning because there's a budget, but there'll be a repeat of a previous programme in the evening, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, no irony intended, and thank you for listening. Good morning. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4.